On February 5th, there are tens of millions of Americans that stop watching professional sports and stop playing fantasy altogether. The Alliance of American Football wants to change that. The Alliance sold a fucking dream. Yeah, it's going to be a brand new professional football league launching a week after the Super Bowl. And they say that they have cutting edge technology, that they're going to change the sports gambling landscape, and they're going to make the game faster and safer than the NFL. So we'll see. He's a dreamer, plane crash survivor. The brains behind the operation. His name is Charlie Ebersol. Um, he's funny. And I think depending on who you talk to, he's either sort of the Willy Wonka of this entire thing or one of the most hated people in spring football. We all worked 24-7, night and day, for the first three months until February 9th. They're saying, this is too good to be true. Why can't we just figure this thing out and get good business and good football and put it together? Just focus on selling tickets. Just put butts in seats and you'll still have your job. Charlie Ebersol thought he could walk right into NBC or Fox. He was a little bit larger than Mike. He drove around with the chauffeur when Uber and Lyft were readily available. We couldn't wait for that first check to hit. We were getting paid by cash. The first little PR stunt came out and said, hey, you know what? Just had a little bit of glitch in the numbers. Don't worry about our payroll. Was that, no. is that true? Payroll? How could you possibly, after week one, fail to pay the players? I've seen a figure of $20 million. That's what they invested. It's kind of hard to spend money when maybe the FBI is seizing your assets. This was the fire Festival of Sports. A complete disaster. I think we reached full circus mode on March 25th when Charlie started to interact with Eminem. It's crazy that it's downplayed like this, but like these are world-class athletes. We went from brand new equipment, halftime at the Super Bowl, to stop taking our hot sauce because we can't afford to replace it anymore. Breaking news tonight in Birmingham, the Alliance of American Football has suspended operations. I just moved us all the way across the country. We just bought a house. I just lost my job. You have no idea the amount of lives that you have screwed over. It was all over in the blink of an eye. Hey, where's the camera? Let me say you something. Man, can, I, can somebody roll me one? Like, we, we really got to talk. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Well, hello there, friends. My name is Tim Hanlon, and you have found Good Seats Still Available, the curious little podcast that is always devoted to what used to be in professional sports. We welcome you to this week's proceedings. And uh, by the intro, uh, the clip, a little uh, scene set, a little palette uh, uh, cleanser, shall we say, we are going to get back into a story that doesn't go too far back. Actually, 2019 uh, is when it uh, literally came and went. The Alliance of American Football. Yes, we uh, had some early episodes back uh, uh, when the league was stumbling and uh, and then uh, falling apart and then uh, uh, into its uh, um, crash and burn uh, ending. Uh, Connor Orr, our episode number 113, and our pal Michael Rothstein in our episode number 119. That was sort of in the immediate math uh, aftermath of... Uh, the cratering of the Alliance. And um, it's been a little bit of time, not a whole lot. Some would argue, is it too soon? Um, We don't think so. It's always worth investigating uh, these kinds of topics and in particular, the the bold and audacious uh, ideas and uh, uh, concepts around the Alliance of American Football. With our guest this week, Steve Potter, who has uh, created this wonderful and really intriguing and well done documentary on the Alliance of American Football. It's called Alliance is Broken. Literally just came out last week. It is available uh, on places like Amazon Prime and Vimeo and uh, YouTube uh, for download. Uh, You can rent it. You can buy it. uh, Apple uh, uh, TV, uh, other various places and more to come. It's uh, it's out there and it is worth getting. even though it's only two and a half years since the Charlie Ebersol uh, founded uh, Alliance of American Football uh, came and went, the story is um, just as intriguing as it was back when we first investigated. 
Uh, and uh, it is uh, still very raw, frankly, for quite a lot of people. Uh, this documentary is it's uh, really well done, and it's it's got uh, an amazing amount of uh, insider type footage. Uh, as uh, as Steve will talk about in a few minutes, he uh, among uh, various other folks were uh, kind of on the inside in many respects, helping create uh, content for uh, players uh, and uh, uh, and team um, uh, marketers, et cetera. You know, social media and. Uh, behind the scenes kinds of footage, vlogging, uh, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, at the time, back in um, early 2019, right, this was all part of the hype machine for this uh, fledgling spring league that was going to beat the new version of the XFL to market by coming back and uh, trying spring football again. But uh, unwittingly, this became almost uh, the essence of the documentary, which has now since uh, come about two plus years later. Uh, and uh, this uh, footage is it's it's great to, and amazing to see because uh, it's truly like you're seeing some of this stuff happen uh, in real time. It, we know the story, right? Uh, Charlie Ebersol, the um, dreamer, if you will, a uh, great lineage from his uh, his father, a, a TV legend in uh, in sports production. Uh, his father, Dick, uh, uh, you know, the guy who went uh, into business on a handshake with uh, Vince McMahon and the original XFL. Longtime NBC sports uh, producer extraordinaire, arguably uh, the guy, Dick Ebersol, who uh, it was responsible for the model that uh, now sort of uh, is uh, the engine behind the NBC coverage and delivery of the Olympics every two and four years. Charlie uh, Ebersol, uh, interesting character, uh, was the guy who uh, did the 30 for 30 documentary on the fall of the original XFL. Uh, for better or for worse, I guess he thought that that was enough background uh, to start up a league, uh, and certainly nobly. I, I think you know there's a lot of uh, a lot of great ideas uh, and a lot of uh, uh, interesting concepts. Uh, the the business modeling, all of it, was really really intriguing, and I think it's really hard to not have fallen for that uh, gift of uh, of narrative that that Charlie Ebersol brought to this enterprise. Uh, back in its fledgling days in 2018 and uh, around launch in 2019. But as we'll find out or be reminded about, or for the, maybe for the first time, if you're new to this AAF story, the wheels fell uh, off this uh, this uh, uh, this milk crate uh, very, very quickly uh, and uh, in dramatic and dizzying speed uh, uh, to the consternation and the confusion uh, of many, many, uh, frankly, all of the people involved uh, to the point where Many of them didn't even recognize that things were uh, not uh, what they were claimed to be. Uh, it's a story of uh, investment intrigue, uh, venture capital, and uh, 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 money that uh, you know people actually didn't have. Uh, it's a story about hubris uh, and selling the dream. It's about uh, we've seen this many, many times, not just pro football players, but players of lots of professional sports getting a chance with a seemingly legitimate alternative uh, league to try once again to sort of uh, reach for their professional dreams. Uh, it's a story of uh, marketing professionals and ticket selling professionals and um, and football uh, uh, people, uh, coaches and, and trainers and, and, uh, and players for sure who, you know, who saw this as not only an opportunity, but um, uh, a chance to kind of keep their not only their dreams alive, but have a, a professional football experience and a career uh, extended uh, beyond what maybe the NFL could or could not offer them. Shake vigorously and uh, throw in television, throw in uh, hype, throw in uh, the realities of the perception of the fans and, and the media, and uh, and it's. Um, a very twisted and sad and and but highly intriguing tale of the alliance of american football now with its very own documentary and we're going to get into it with the um the creator of it steve potter uh, and again it's called alliance is broken and it's truly and literally available now uh and uh, we can't wait to share our conversation that we had just uh, a couple of days back with steve uh, as we talk about the aaf in just a few moments time. Stay tuned. It's eye opening for sure. This week's uh, little sponsor uh, du jour du of the week, uh, whatever of the do it is, 
is our pal Dean Mitchell and Sports History Collectibles. Dot com. Strangely, sportshistorycollectibles.com, we couldn't find any Alliance of American football stuff. Uh, I know there's a fairly healthy market for it out there on eBay. Uh, I know um, uh, there are some, uh, shall we say, less than uh, stellar uh, attempts out there to kind of um, you know, issue some uh, uh, T-shirts and that kind of stuff. I, I think uh, a lot of the... Uh, um, the trademarks and that kind of stuff and the original stuff is is kind of held under lock and key or is, is, is heavily trademarked still. Uh, I think the stuff on eBay is largely legit and uh, is just sort of uh, crept out of, I guess, of the vaults of all the all the material and the stuff that's out, that was out there. Um, but I hope that uh, our pal Dean will find his way to getting uh, a lot of uh, Alliance of American fo- football stuff for uh, what is arguably probably the best and most focused and well lit uh, sports memorabilia site there out on the web at sportshistorycollectibles.com. I mean, you literally think of any league or any team uh, of the past across all kinds of sports and and events and stuff, and you're likely to find many items there, uh, reasonably priced, uh, uh, tremendously photographed, so you can you know what you're getting, and it's just it's a trove, and there's new stuff coming in there every week. And uh, it, it's it's really good stuff, and you can trust uh, the source because it's you don't have to sort of worry about sort of all the this is all the stuff has been verified and uh, uh, is in the um, uh, the catacombs there of the uh, the Dean Mitchell experience. So it, all the stuff is there, and he 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 literally painstakingly photographs all this stuff, and so you know it's coming from a, a legit source. Uh, and again, you're not going to find a better collection of stuff from from leagues and teams and, and sporting events that. Uh, have come and gone then at sportshistorycollectibles.com. So we won't ding Dean uh, and his pals too much for the lack of AAF uh, material. And let's be honest, uh, there's, there's a lot of great logo stuff and uh, from the AAF. I, one of the things that the, the Alliance got right, I think, were the logos and the team names and stuff and the color schemes and stuff. So, um, But while you wait... And while we wait for AAF material to show up at sportshistorycollectibles.com, why don't you check out all the other stuff, including, of course, a huge trove of stuff from various football leagues no longer with us. I mean, you name them, the original XFL and and the World League of American Football and WFL, on and on and on. All kinds of stuff there and all kinds of teams and leagues and stuff, not just the football. Sportshistorycollectibles.com. And of course, we have a promo code for you. Uh, that uh, you can use early and often to save, save big, save uh, a lot uh, when you make those uh, those purchases that you inevitably will do. We almost guarantee it. The promo code for you at sportscentricollectibles.com, it's good seats. Good seats. That's the promo code for 15% off all of your purchases uh, when you go there early, often, and repeatedly at sportshistorycollectibles.com. Bookmark it. You'll uh, be glad you did. Keep checking it because there's lots of great stuff. And um, hopefully you AAF uh, hoarders out there uh, will uh, send Dean some stuff, uh, perhaps on consignment, and uh, we'll have uh, some actual Alliance uh, of American football stuff to uh, look at, enjoy, and purchase from our pal Dean, our good pal Dean at sportshistorycollectibles.com. Thanks, Dean. Thanks for putting up with our our little digs this week and thank you to you all the great listeners out there. Uh, and let's, uh, let's dial it up. Shall we let's get to our conversation with Steve Potter. We're going to talk about the Alliance right now. Uh, the, uh, the movie again, it's called the Alliance is broken. It's a story of the AAF. Let's get into it. Here's our chat, please. Enjoy. I'm just really curious, maybe just to kind of sort of table set here. Um, Give me a sense of of what your entree to this is. Are you a professional filmmaker by trade? And and even if not, why the Alliance a story still relatively new and fresh, if you can believe it? Yeah, um, honestly, I'm not. You know, I went to college to be a filmmaker, and and uh, eventually hopes to be a documentarian. Um, I was working at Fox Sports uh, for a little while. Um, right when the Alliance was kind of becoming fresh. And, and I was in Orlando at the time. I went to uh, 
college at Full Sail University, which is in Winter Park, Florida, uh, right outside of Orlando, about 10 minutes outside of Orlando. And um, I was doing, uh, you know, editing sports-based documentary content for Fox. So, you know, when they would have a Tampa Bay Rays player go to a children's hospital, and I just, I loved the whole storytelling aspect of of sports. I grew up a huge uh, diehard Philadelphia sports fan. I'm from the South Jersey area. So big Eagles fan and, and, you know, just being involved in sports is what my goal was. Um, and so the, the fact that to being able to tell stories through sports, which is another passion that, you know, filmmaking, that was kind of the, the, the original goal um, for my career path. And I became kind of friendly with some of the Alliance players uh, out of Orlando you know, just from uh, them being UCF players. And, you know, I was doing at the time uh, freelance social media content creation. Um, so if certain guys, you know, wanted a workout video of them lifting weights, and that was kind of what I was doing. So I happened to meet a lot of players who were eventually going to play in the AAF. And like I said, I wanted to, you know, get into documentary filmmaking. So when, excuse me, when the team came to Orlando, they were looking for a ton of just media coverage, wh- whether you did podcasts or videos or just social media videos uh, on your own Instagram account. Um, so my goal was to, you know, go out to the, the local, uh, they did stuff at uh, public eateries and, and high school football fields. Obviously I'm sure you saw in the film. Um, so they did a lot of stuff like that. And I was like, you know what, I'm here. I'm just going to bring my camera out and start filming some stuff. And um, that's kind of how I fell into it. And, you know, I kind of became that guy and, you know, uh, I'm, actually in a wheelchair. So I'm pretty easy to spot. So a lot of people, when they saw me, you know, rolling around the practice field or the, the, you know, bar where all the players are hanging out, they kind of started to talk to me. And that's how we got to know some of the players. And when the league was starting to crash, they, um, you know, they were like, Oh man, it'd be crazy if you did a documentary on this. And I was kind of like, well, you, you know, we could interview you. That'd be awesome. And that was a very early stage of just like, Hey, let's try to make a documentary. And, um, you know, almost, Three years later, here we are now. <laughs> so that's kind of how I got my feet wet with it. So, so that's that's really interesting. So it sounds to me like you were uh, almost enmeshed, even even uh, officially, I guess, to some extent, with the with the Apollos on the ground as they were getting up and running in the league. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just like I said, they were very local to the Orlando area, and they were looking for people and you know to to get as much content in the area as possible, and. Um, I was just kind of there and, you know, I got to meet a lot of people in the front office and a lot of people in the, on the team level and player level and stuff like that. And, you know, it ends up kind of just working out that way. Like I said, they trusted me to share their story, which was pretty awesome. Um, but that's kind of how it went. But one of the things that strikes me having watched the documentary uh, last night was um, I, I just find myself scratching my head to like, how did you get this kind of footage, right? There are outtakes of Steve Spurrier doing doing promos and spots, right? Uh, there's, you know, stuff like uh, uh, you, hard to believe that you, you got these these pretty cool and, and somewhat intimate angles during a, a relatively obscure uh, training camp uh, in the early days. Uh, I, I just so it, it really struck me like there had to be some kind of insider uh, to some extent, uh, uh, access. And, and that, that certainly explains it on the Orlando side, but I'm guessing, uh, a, as you were doing your work, you also made relationships and friends, uh, at some of the other teams and, and, and around the league as well, that ultimately got you the same kind of, you know, backhand footage for, for the documentary when you decided you were going to go for that. Yeah. Like I said, like, you know, in the Orlando area specifically, they were, um, very open to allowing cameras everywhere. Just, hey, just come out and post us on social media, tag us, and we can share it. And, hey, we'll help you kind of, you know, uh, put you on the map too if, if, you, if we could post your footage to our social media. So, like I said, they were very willing to just let anybody come in, which, you know, honestly is kind of surprising because if you look at like an entity like the NFL, they are so closed off. You know, you have to be top-notch to get in and, and just be around NFL players. You can't even bring a camera into the stadium. Um, w- without a media credential. And, um, you know, honestly, around the league, the people that I met, fortunately, were actually uh, people from YouTube and the Internet. Uh, the league, like I said, was very open. So a lot of people were, you know, doing vlog, uh, vlog-type content um, and and recording their game day experiences. So there was, you know, uh, a guy named Dylan Sesco. He had a bunch of YouTube clips of, of vlogging his experience at the San Diego fleet. And he did drone content, uh, a flyovers of the stadium and 
and, you know, uh, zooming in on players from the, the stands and, and that type of stuff. And he was kind enough to let us use that. And surprisingly, there was almost someone like that in almost every city, um, which kind of just was fortunate that it worked out that way. Uh, the league was very well publicized and, you know, tried to get as many local content creators involved. And, you know, that's kind of how we were able to cover the whole aspect of the league and capturing, uh, you know, vast amounts of footage from different cities is because of that uh, exactly right there. And, you know, that's especially interesting because that, that's it's almost sort of um, the fact that that uh, that the league's demise, uh, rise and demise or was, was so relatively fresh, um, you know, within a couple of years. Right. We're you know, it, that's really kind of a, a, a huge and growing dynamic in in coverage, so to speak. For example, I, I you know, I got sort of enmeshed in into some of this um, uh, superstar racing experience thing. Tony Stewart this uh, this year, this summer, had a bunch of races on Saturday nights and dirt tracks and, and short tracks and stuff. And then there's uh, there's uh, this uh, uh, woman driver named Haley Deegan, uh, who was part of that and rush, uh, does uh, races in the Camping World Truck Series and that kind of stuff. And she's all of like 19, I think. And it's so it's so natural for her and her brother and her team there to literally do vlogs every day, essentially behind the scenes of like what she's doing during her life and stuff. So in many respects, I think this was almost like, and perhaps because of the huge encouragement, we'll get into why in a minute uh, of, of that publicity, right? I mean, this, this kind of organic uh, uh, content, if you will, is, was a relatively new phenomenon. And unwittingly this became kind of a treasure trove for you to actually, I mean, it probably saved you a whole hell of a lot of uh, effort, at least to start to get going on this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and if you look at something as similar to the fire festival, you know, their, their whole, that whole documentary, whether it was the Netflix or Hulu one was based off of a similar concept. You know, there were so many people vlogging and documenting their experience when they got stuck on that Island, they had just a, a plethora of footage to choose from. Um, and, and, you know, they probably either didn't have to pay for it or just was like, hey, we'll put your Instagram handle in there and shout you out. And, you know, people like that type of stuff. And, you know, it's just we live in a world where everybody is filming everything on a consistent basis. And, you know, that's kind of, I, I guess, interesting for, for documentaries and stuff like this going towards the future, that this is where we're headed. I mean, people just film everything and vlog everything and they want to share their experience. And I think this you know, that, that definitely helped us big time was, you know, knowing that there's so much out there and knowing that people are willing to share that. So, you know, they could be part of a, I guess, a bigger uh, shared experience to show the world what they, they went through as well, you know? So, so what did you, what did you think this league and the Apollos were when you got involved in earnest back as a, a freelancer slash, I guess, somewhat check receiver, I guess, for some of your work, what did you What did you think? No, you I, get, oh, okay. But what did you think you were getting? Yeah, into? I, um, yeah. I actually didn't get paid at all for anything uh, from them, and and you know never really sought payment either. It was kind of just I wanted to grow my brand, and and hey, if someone wanted to use my footage, and you know go ahead, and you know that type of stuff. But um, I really thought it was you know everybody in the Orlando area was and, and you know league wide was kind of getting in something uh, on the ground level. And I thought that this was, you know, my personal opinion, I thought the league was actually going to work. <laughs> um, you know, you see a lot of these leagues have failed in the past and, and this was one that had, you know, what, from what it looked like, it had their branding to an, a complete T it had their, um, the, the football was actually good football. It was exciting. Uh, people were, you know, Eminem was talking about it on Twitter, uh, exchanging with Eversol a couple of times. And like, you know, it was something again, going back to the whole social media thing that was just, fun snackable content that people enjoyed um and i think that in my opinion that the league early on was like wow they are here and they're here to stay because they're involving the local community in in their marketing efforts and and getting people excited and trying to get people to come to these games and buy season tickets and but they're also giving back in the sense they're out at the local establishments and signing autographs and having players hang out with kids and taking pictures and you know, it just seemed like they really did a really good job of getting their marketing efforts aligned um, before kind of just launching this league. But obviously, <laughs> that's, not, that's not really what happened. Yeah, well, look, I, I agree. I, th- I think the marketing in particular was, uh, uh, and I think, you know, there are a lot of things that a lot of people have just, you know, sort of thrown under the bus as, as it sort of, you know, uh, crashed and burned, right? But but I, with all due respect, I don't think the logos and the iconography and the... Um, 
uh, the the visuals uh, of how the game was set up and looked on television, um, uh, the quality of play. I guess I could I could argue about a little bit, but 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 still, in terms of the, the color schemes and the uh, you know, I it was sharp looking, right? Uh, the yeah. uniform uh, uh, contrasts and and um, but then again, you know. Uh, 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 marketing and logos do not necessarily a league make, right? That's arguably <laughs> the, the somewhat easy stuff, right? It, the, the the real hard stuff is the football, uh, the fans, and oh yeah, by the way, the money, right? Yeah, yep, exactly. And I mean, you know, it's definitely one thing. The league looked awesome at first. You know, it had it, it was different. It was fun. It was uh, exciting, I guess you could say, because a lot of these cities did not have pro- or still don't have professional football in most of them. And it was something that I think people were really trying to sink their teeth into quick. But at the same time, like you said, all that is just, that is the easy stuff. Anybody, and, you know, going back to the whole, we're in a digital age, anybody can create a brand and post it online and make it look something larger than life when it's really not that. Um, And that's what I feel like a lot of it as the league started to kind of move uh, throughout the week, the week to week basis was that it was something that was just glamorized and it wasn't really taken care of, um, the right way i guess you could say and obviously the first way you saw that was week one after the players didn't get paid that was just you know or you know i'm sorry after week two when the players didn't get paid that was just the first step into oh god what is this league really about and what are what are they really doing here when did you kind of know personally uh that things were a little askance right because i i agree i think you look at the the first week and then the build-up and stuff and i think a lot of people you know tune in for curiosity's sake and and we're we're uh, more than pleasantly surprised at, at how tight and solid uh, the product looked and and uh, and all that stuff, right? But but you're you're kind of sort of nibbling around the edges there, sort of somewhat on the inside, or at least having some uh, connection with 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 the, the the locals there in Orlando and stuff. When did you sort of get a sense that uh, it went? It was going from uh, everybody, you know, going into it in all earnestness, and then changing, if you will, into questions and then frankly (laughs) gloom and doom yeah yeah no i mean at first it was kind of what i think everybody saw was well actually you know kind of going back a little bit but um the first thing that just seemed weird was again they you know in the area they hyped it up to be this amazing league and we have all these big time investors and these big time people that are involved and we have the head ball coach steve spurrier you know uh college football hall of fame and you know as a player and as a coach and you know he is football royalty essentially right and the the first time the apollos came to town they were practicing on a high school field and when you're just looking at it from like a bird's eye you're like wait a minute you have all these players out here you're you have iheart radio broadcasting at the event talking about apollos football is here and we're ready to go and it's on a high school football field and not even a nice high school football field it was a a grass with or a grass field with tons of potholes and it looked like mole holes and guys were slipping and it, you know, I'm saying you saw in the film, um, you know, that was kind of like the first shock, like that's kind of weird. Um, and then after that, I mean, everything looked pretty smooth, smooth going on uh, going forward. And then, you know, week two hit and the guys didn't get paid. Um, and it's like, okay, well that, that kind of threw a lot of red flags, I think in everybody's opinion. And it's like, well, you know, they say they have all this money and, you know, they're, you know, selling tickets, it looks like, and they're on TV. So there's clearly some advertising dollars going around. Why aren't the guys getting paid? You know, they are the main, the main draw, you know, they're the football players They're That's what you're paying to see. And if they're not getting paid, they're not going to play. You know, and that was kind of the big thing that was like, that kind of shifted focus for me and the, you know, just being around, I was like, wow, okay, maybe this, this might fall apart kind of quick. Cause obviously you've seen it in the past with the, XFL, the original XFL and the, you know, USFL. So, and, you know, however many leagues also that were in the past, um, that this could happen. So that's kind of what really pushed me into like, wow, maybe I should start quote unquote documenting what's happening in the area. Um, and that's kind of how I got shifted more into the documentary side of things. But that was, yeah, that was really the big thing. I think everybody kind of, that was the first large red flag that was like, okay, maybe we should be cautious about this moving forward. But there was belief, though, right? I mean, you had, uh, I mean, you're talking about, uh, you know, a a larger than life personality in Charlie Ebersol. Uh, You're talking about uh, supposedly major investors, uh, some of which sort of fell apart and 
and and and venture capital and and uh, but but then also along with that, right? You know, sort of the bravado and the I don't know. I having worked in the in the media technology investment space for some time, the arrogance, right, of the big ideas and that come along with that money, right? And you know, at the end of the day, right, it's it's a, it's football, it's a league. There's players and there's fans and it's sport, right? But um, as you lay out in the documentary fairly early on, um, that wasn't fully maybe the investment thesis that uh, at least some of the investors were sort of putting out there. There was this, I don't know, this tech slash app slash betting slash interactivity kind of thing uh, that feels foreign to me and and or, or rushed, I guess, versus what about the football? How much of that cre- crept into your your understanding as you were helping out on the sidelines, et cetera, you know, with some content and stuff. Did, any of that? Yeah. I mean, honestly, no, nobody really talked about the app. Um, that was something that was totally kind of, you know, more of geared towards the fans. Um, I don't think it was really, uh, you know, from the people we interviewed that, that, you know, that worked in the offices, nobody really even knew what was happening with the app. So when they, you know, from some of the things that people said when we interviewed them, you know, they would get calls and ask questions about the app. And, you know, nobody in the front office knew how to work this app. Um, you know, and I know personally nothing about developing or, or coding or anything, but I can't imagine it's just that easy to just throw up this magical app that you could track players in real time and, and you know, track their stats because that's not, you know, I mean, if, if it was so easy, why, why hasn't the NFL done it or the MLB or the NHL? But this new random startup spring football league, has this magical app power. Um, it, 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 that was kind of like, just again, weird. Like how, how do they have this, but nobody else does and how do they get it so quickly? Um, that was one of the biggest things I think we were, while we were doing these interviews, you know, this was, we did a, all these interviews post AAF, um, the post collapse of the AAF. And that was one of the things we were, me and my crew were kind of wondering was like, how did, how did this just happen? Like, you know, did, nobody, really paid attention to this app throughout the season, but they're promoting it and they're saying how great it is. Why wasn't this looked into more? Um, so, you know, I hope that kind of answers your, your question yeah. about the app. But, yeah. yeah. So uh, maybe let's uh, maybe we step back for a second. I'll, uh, I'll come at it maybe even from another, another way. And this maybe goes to sort of give me the process um, of, of how you uh, decided to put this uh, documentary together. So another thing that struck me when watching it, right, is that, you're not uh, interviewing and you don't have, and for probably for obvious reasons, uh, some of the most major players, if you will, in this story, right? Charles Ebersol, probably not talking about this anytime soon. Probably a tough get, right? Uh, Tom Dundon probably doesn't want to talk much about it. Uh, uh, you know, all the major sort of, you know, figureheads sort of in this, Peter Thiel and and, and some of these others, right? Um but th- that said, that's not necessarily a, n- a knock or a negative by any stretch, because a lot of the folks that you talk to and give the stories in this in this documentary, and I don't want to give it away, but uh, I'm trying to entice people to watch it, are, I wouldn't call them average people, but people very much in the mix of what's going on, right? You've got a bunch of players and their wives and uh, and and fellow content creators like yourself and, and, and others that are on the payroll doing so, promotional people. Uh, you've got people... Um, you know, who were, uh, you know, a part of the investment uh, group and just other sort of onlookers, you know, reporters like the Connor Ors of the world, right? Who, you know, um, I, to me, that's actually a little bit more revealing, right? Because these are people whose paychecks and livelihoods are much more visceral and much more literally paycheck to paycheck because these are the folks, with all due respect, that have have to believe and then you know, and then put their belief into action in order for any of these grand ideas to possibly even become close to reality. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this league would have never happened if it wasn't for the people we interviewed, Um, because if they started this league and no one believed in it, that we wouldn't even be talking because the league would have just never have happened. Um, So the biggest thing for me with, you know, figuring out who we want to talk to, like I said, I've seen the XFL documentary and the USFL documentary and all that. And, you know, I, I really, wanted to talk to the people who actually were in the ground floor on the day to day, you know, to who they were told, you know, because my thing is when you interview these big hotshot guys, they're there 100% to protect themselves, rightfully so, which I understand, but they're not actually, the chances are of them giving you a honest answer are probably slim. Um, they're not going to tell you things, how they actually were or how they were meant to be. So one of our goals was to talk to people that were actually given the information from the top 
and they were told how to go out and market this league to these cities and, you know, essentially, I don't want to say take people's money, but um, get them to become customers. And it was, you know, they're putting their personal brands on the line and, and their, you know, uh, clientele list. I mean, I know um, Orlando had a gentleman who was with the Orlando Magic uh, as a senior ticket sales exec- executive. He was there for like 25 years. So he left the Magic. He came to the Apollos. He's reaching out to his customers that have trusted him as a, a Magic, Orlando Magic ticket sales person for 20 something years. And he's putting his name on the line to say, hey, come be a part of this league. So I wanted to talk to people like that and to be, you know, to ask them, what were you told from the top? Um, were you told that this league was this grandiose thing and, you know, we really have the money or were, is that not what you were told? And you just had to portray that image still. Um, so I think that was something that was really cool that, you know, I, I mean, I'm not, try, <laughs> not trying to pat myself on the back, but something that me and my crew did that was like kind of different. Um, you know, because a lot of these leagues, if you, or these documentaries, if you don't talk to the, the head honcho, it's like you almost try to figure out is it credible or is it not credible. And um, that was something I feel like there was just so many people involved in this league. Um, th- this, this was something that they deserved to uh, they they were deserved to, to share their story and how they got roped into this circus as well. How, how would you describe uh, the the mood of the people that you interviewed? It's obviously still very fresh in a lot of people's minds, and I'm sure there's still a lot of sort of hurt and 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 and, and disillusionment and stuff, right? And and maybe a little bit more time to pass might make it uh, might help solve some of those uh, those feelings. But I get the sense that this is still very raw for a lot of people. Um, especially those, the rank and file, shall we say, that, that, that make the bread and butter of your interviews here. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of people that were angry and, and hurt and confused. And, you know, because, again, they were told the same thing as the, the fans were. Hey, we have this large investor, $250 million, and we're going to be here for three years. So invest in our team and, you know, invest in our franchise, whether that was the employees moving to the area um, whether that was football players uh, quitting their day jobs, uh, whether if it was insurance sales or athletic training or anything like that, quit your day job, come play for us, invest in our in our uh, team, you know, invest in our franchise. So I think a lot of it was people were hurt. You know, it was they were promised uh, a bill of goods and um, they were kind of left on their butt. And, you know, people were confused, too, because, you know, you had uh, the one guy, Dylan uh, Smith, who was the athletic trainer, he um you know, he was over at TCU as an athletic trainer for them. And, um, you know, he was kind of sold this, you know, you can come here, get a higher ranking position, come work for us. And, you know, him and his wife packed up and sold their house in Texas and moved to Orlando, bought a house, and and they got stuck here, you know, with a 30-year mortgage and a home that he was supposed to be paying for with the job he was promised. And, you know, within eight weeks, that job is gone. Um, and it's nothing, you know, someone like him or anybody else did to deserve it. It's just, they all kind of got bought into the system. So I think a lot of the people we interviewed were, it was still fresh and they were kind of, uh, angry, confused and, you know, irritated to be honest with you. All right, what's this? Lucy Nicotine. Yes. Well, hey, look, folks, we're all adults here, and some of us choose to use nicotine to relax, focus, or just unwind after a long day. And Lucy Nicotine is a company that was created to help nicotine users find a cleaner option and feel better about the ways they consume nicotine. Now, look, I, I'm not a smoker. I've not been a chewing uh, tobacco kind of guy. Uh, we all know that uh, nicotine is absolutely endemic uh, to those uh uh, activities. Uh, and uh, you look, if you're looking to evolve, say, from the smoking habit, uh, but recognize that nicotine is, is part of the mix, well, perhaps Lucy Nicotine uh, is a, a helpful way uh, to evolve from uh, those habits. Their latest product is called Slim Nicotine Pouches, uh, which contain pure synthetic nicotine and, and provide the same satisfaction that nicotine users expect without any tobacco at all. Uh, Lucy Slim Pouches use the newest technology for synthesizing, he says, pure nicotine in the lab. None of the tobacco and all of the nicotine satisfaction. Uh, They come in three strengths, four, eight, and 12 milligrams, and three exclusive and uh, inviting flavors, spearmint, mango, and cool cider. 
So don't compromise when you're choosing your nicotine products. Go with the newest tobacco-free options from Lucy Nicotine. And my listeners can go to lucy.co and use the promo code GOODSEATS to get 20% off your order of Lucy Slim Pouches or any other of the Lucy Nicotine products. That's lucy.co and use promo code GOODSEATS at checkout. Now, I got to use this disclaimer. Warning, this product contains non-tobacco nicotine and nicotine is an addictive chemical. Thank you, Lucy Nicotine, for your sponsorship of the show. And now back to our conversation. Look, I, obviously, this league uh, is uh, enmeshed uh, in the person of Charlie Ebersol. And obviously, you didn't get a chance to, to, to talk to him. And, and I'm sure that is just the, a mother load of interviews to come at some point someday in the future. Um, but what, what's your interpretation of an arguably fascinating yet very complicated sort of guy? Because, um, I, I, you know, I, it's hard to kind of separate the league from him because there was so much of both wrapped up in each other in your interpretations from the people that you talked to was this sort of naivete was this hucksterism was this uh somewhat something in between what's what's your thesis about the charlie ebersol part of this story yeah i mean for that's a really awesome question um i think majority of it was it was a mix of both of being naive and, and was this a scam? Um, now my personal opinion, I think that, um, you know, honestly, the guy was just in over his head. Um, you know, it, it was, it's such a large, it's such a, I don't know how to explain it, but it, it's so daunting to run a football league um, by yourself. And, you know, unfortunately as a business owner, when you come out and you say, Hey, we have it and we have the money and we have the people and the staff and my connections from, you know, who my family is, um, people buy into that and they believe that. So if you're going to put your name out there and put your face out there and attach yourself to the company that you're building, you better hope you're, you can put your money where your mouth is, um, in that aspect of things, just like the, uh, you know, Ther- I believe the documentary is called Theranos, the, about the, uh, one that HBO did about the medicine company. Um, that it was like a quick pop up tech start tech tech startup medicine company, and you know it's like the same thing. It's like you have to be able to if you're gonna sell this this vision that you have as an entrepreneur or, or a business owner, you have to be able to back it up. Um, but I think from the people that we interviewed, their opinion of it was it was you know kind of a hoax and kind of you know it was just he was just naive to what it would really take to run a football company because you know a lot of these guys the football players have played in the nfl and a lot of the staff we had um interviewed either worked in the nfl or another professional sports franchise so they know what it's like to be on the day-to-day of uh of of a sports league especially the football players so i think a lot of them even realized that you know this is not what it was like when we worked at the mlb or when we played in the nfl um so i think that's definitely a big thing too that a lot of people realize that this guy was really just super naive. Yeah, I think it's it's especially interesting, too, because, well, a couple of different things. I mean, number one, obviously, you know, Charlie was part of uh, that uh, XFL documentary, the ESPN 30 for 30, right? And that, you know. Yeah, he yeah, directed it, yeah. Right, and and the lineage, of course, of, of you know, from from that of a of sports television legend in, in his father, Dick, right? Um, while on one level, that makes, that makes a lot of sense and sort of adds some, a, a nice storyline to the to the background and to the to the myth mythology of all of it and the excitement around it, but then you kind of look back and you go, well, that's kind of a thin resume, right? Uh, doing a documentary and learning about you know the XFL and 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 I think in hindsight, a lot of people kind of recognized now that that you know he kind of in some respects kind of rushed this league so that he could beat uh, uh, Vince McMahon back to the punch for the, his 2.0 version of XFL. So. It's just it, to me. It's it, that's really intriguing that, that there's both that sort of thin resume as well as sort of a rushed kind of feeling to kind of beat, you know, uh, the, the 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 resurrection of the XFL again and and supposedly be able to do it, you know, more smart than than Vince and his dad did early on. Yeah, I mean that's like saying now I made a documentary about the AF. I'm going to go launch my own league. 
and I can tell you, I will absolutely never watch a football league. It yeah, that was my like, that was my next is, question. Yeah, <laughs> it it seems like such a just an absolute, uh, like I said before, daunting task to do this. And you know, learning how you know that's one thing too. I learned a lot about uh, football throughout this process. You know, just the business side of football and what it really takes to run a franchise and a, and a team and a, or you know a, a, a league. Um, I could never even imagine trying to start something like this. Um, you know, and again, like I understand where he came from, you know, he had a lot of, uh, big people in his, in his, uh, Rolodex to, to be able to call upon for help. And, you know, but at the same time, I mean, he's a young guy and so many other weathered, uh, business people and sports executives have tried to do this before and they failed. So, you know, it kind of makes you wonder, like if they failed, what makes you think that, you know, you could have done it better or, uh, your group of people have could have done it better, but it's just, you know, um, at the end of the day, it was just it was just very rushed. Yeah, obviously. That, that said, though, I mean, you need that kind of uh, dreamer type in the sort of founder slash CEO type role. But I think you, you hit the nail on the head, right? I mean, you know, for that sort of story, that sort of visionary kind of uh, uh, narrative, right? You know, Ebersol's perfect for that, right? But without the, sort of the backup of that, right? Now, uh, you know, I think. I think a lot of people in, you know, as this thing was sort of uh, getting up and running and then sort of in its its collapse and denouement, um, I don't think people question really sort of the football setup, right? I mean, Bill Pullian, um, he was, the, was a co- labeled as a co-founder of this league and essentially was head of football uh, for all of this, um, a well-respected uh, uh, pro football executive. He was, the, he was the general manager for the Buffalo Bills for you know, a long period of time leading that, you know, he was part of the four Super Bowl appearances that they made and stuff. You, you probably couldn't have chosen a better guy to kind of put the football stuff together. Um, it doesn't feel to me like that part was really lacking. I mean, but you tell me, though, based on what you saw, maybe aside from that first Apollo's uh, training uh, exercise at the at that high school. Yeah, no, I mean, that was one of the biggest things, too, is that we've kind of discovered throughout this documentary making process a lot of these guys that were the head of you know uh, football operations and player safety uh you know heinz ward troy palomalu bill polian it seems like honestly they were just sold the same stuff that everybody else was i have this you know big name background i have all this money to put into a league i want to do something better than everybody else that's why it was kind of like i i we didn't want to paint you know we didn't want to paint anybody in a bad light including ebersol because you know this totally could have been just a you know, unfortunate tale of events and he was just in way over his head. It could have nothing, it could have been nothing personal and, you know, that type of stuff. So, but the big thing is we definitely didn't want to highlight, you know, Bill Polian or, or those type of guys because, you know, they, you know, Bill Polian, I believe in an interview he did with ESPN, he talked about, you know, he was unaware of the financial issues that they were having too. So, you know, and, you know, even when we interviewed um, some team presidents and stuff like that, they, they said the same thing. They were told from the top down, we have everything covered. Our money is fine. You have nothing to worry about. So in a sense, Bill Poley and, you know, just theoretically thinking here, Bill Poley and Hines and Troy and all those guys, they could have been, they could have been told the same stuff that the team presidents were told, you know? So you really don't know if it was, you know, if, if it was bad on them too. Cause I mean, I, I hope that kind of answered your question, but you know, Bill Poley certainly did his job with getting great football on the field and, and getting the right people involved to coach, obviously. I mean, um, you know, but yeah, I think a lot of it could have been, um, you know, better for sure if there was a, a bigger budget involved and the money was actually there. So based on your conversations, your interviews and, and, and the, the, the stuff that you sort of put together in, in making this documentary, why do you think the money quote unquote ran out so fast and, and, and it, it just, you know, uh, went sideways so quickly and, and needed that cash infusion that, that Ebersol was basically saying this is, you know, was already planned ahead of time and all that kind of stuff. I mean, trying to, you know, I, I guess the I guess the thought would be, and, and you rightly state it and people talk about it, right? And, and their belief set is, okay, if, if these are like legit people involved, both on the money side and the football side, right? We all know that this is going to take at least a couple of years to kind of solidify. It's going to take a, a a, a decent amount of investment. I mean, either something happened to the money and it just went away more quickly than people envisioned, or maybe there wasn't as much money as was discussed or, or socialized in the first place. I, I guess the question is what happened to the money and when? 
Uh, do, you, do you get any better sense of that in your in this d- documented pursuit? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing was the first investor they had, the, who they took money from. Um, you know, in our research, all we did was Google Reggie Fowler. And the first thing that popped up was actually Dan Kaplan's article um, uh, from Sports Business Journal at the time about how Reggie Fowler committed fraud and was misrepresenting where his money um, or how much he actually had and where his money was living at the time um, when he was working for uh, or when, you know, he was trying to be a part of the Arizona Cardinals franchise. So, I mean, and that took us (laughs) five minutes to research Um, and that, you know, that happened back in the early 2000s. So my thing was, you know, how did whoever was accepting this money um, to run this league, how did they not Google who was giving them, millions and millions of dollars um that that is i think in my opinion problem one um they didn't really vet where the money was coming from and if it was actually even there so i think when the money ran out really quick it was probably because either it was never there or you know obviously as we found out that some of the money was seized by the fbi because of reggie fowler's uh previous issues with other startups he's, he's had so right there that's issue number one um and issue number two i think was how desperate uh, the AAF was to get more money. So they went out to Tom Dundon and said, Hey, we, we just, you know, we need money quick. And I feel like when you, when you're desperate like that, you're willing to take any conditions uh, that the person who has the money is going to give to you um, right then and there. Um, so you don't look bad. And, you know, one thing we learned was, you know, what Connor Orr talked about was um, Tom Dundon allegedly committed $250 million. Right. And that's what, Charlie went on the Rich Eisen show and talked about was, you know, we got $250 million in the bank. We're fine. But what we found out, you know, through Connor Orr's reporting and Dan Kaplan's reporting and guys in the financial industry of sports, they said it was a commitment of, you know, $10 million or such a week um, to, to run this league. So, you know, at that point, that means Tom Dundon could pull out at any point if he sees, you know, my investment's not going anywhere. And that's exactly what happened. Um, he pulled the plug because he realized that, you know, at that point he was in $70 million in just a few weeks at that point. And his, he, I guess, you know, any person has the right to their own money to say, Hey, look, I don't think this is going to work. I don't believe it anymore. I'm done. And that just, I think was the final nail in the coffin, um, for trying to find money. And, you know, like I said, I think he was very, the AAF was very desperate to, uh, just take anything they could get just to try to make it week to week. Um, you know, and I, I think that's, really what happened with the money situation it was really never as guaranteed as you know everybody was led to believe it was yeah it's also it was it seems to me like there's sort of uh, uh various sort of shifting leverage points there too right so you're mentioning essentially the iaf with a, a, a you know a seized fund or you know a, a freezing money and that kind of stuff and and making it more of a desperate situation to bring in cash right well that automatically makes uh, Charlie's uh, AAF far uh, less able to leverage anything or, or negotiate anything, right? So they got to take terms to get the money quickly. But it's interesting bec- and ironic because then I, or you could make the argument that Dundon got kind of delevered as well when he started to make these proclamations about, well, we need a relationship with the NFL, uh, either you know to be sort of official you know, feeder league or, or some other kinds of things and, and the players association and that kind of stuff. And, and, and frankly, Dundon didn't have any leverage in that conversation because it's the friggin' NFL, right? What are the, they, they could care less, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things a lot of people we interviewed talked about was, was that just an out to, so he didn't look like a bad person because, you know, one thing a lot of people said too, was if it wasn't for Dundon, their job would have ended in week two uh, when they actually had no more money. Um, so a lot of employees and football players were honestly thankful to Tom Dundon for saying, you know what, I'll give it a shot. Um, but at the same time, they, it makes you wonder, like, was that an exit strategy for him just to say, you know what, I'm done. I, I want out. And, be, you know, since it's my money, it's my term. And if the NFL doesn't want to be a part of it, I'm done. You know, and, and again, is that's fair for him because I, I, I have nothing close to $10 million at all. And I can't even imagine losing – that much on a weekly basis like that's you know that that's insane um so it makes you wonder like it, was he just told that hey you know we can get in with the nfl whatever you want just give us your money to help us and he realized quickly that that was not true that that's a theory or it was just you know he just didn't want to be a part of it anymore and he said hey look you know the big the way to make money here is to be a part of the nfl 
And if they want nothing to do with it, then I'm out. And that would be theory too. Yeah, and that feels a little uh, some naivete there too, right? Because you could make the argument like if if okay, so if if Dunham was sold a bill of goods and he really didn't know what he was getting into and then recognized quickly and wanted to pull out, okay, that's one that's one story and one one theme, right? But the other one is that you know is is okay. This is a guy who owns the Carolina Hurricanes. And and I'm sh- a sore topic for our friends who are in Hartford and former Whalers fans. Uh, but uh, yeah. Guess, um, uh, you know, and and is is uh, been part of uh, you know successful startups in the in the past and stuff. So let's give him credit and think of him, okay, maybe he's not, uh, you know, uh, naive and he does have some sort of financial savvy. Um, you would think that he would enter this not only with eyes wide open and 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 a realistic understanding of the NFL, but at the very least. Again, all in hindsight, and I didn't have the money, it's his, right? To at least play out the season to the best of one's ability to do so, so that that would actually give maybe some semblance of leverage and whatnot, right? We got our first season, we learned a lot. A lot of the ways you can spin that story by at least grinding it out and getting the, the, the season done, that's a hell of a lot better of a place to be, even if you run out of money at that time, or he wants to then maybe reassess, then truly pulling the plug in the middle of the season to do that. And so dramatically that must either, he got scared very quickly and acutely or, um, you know, or maybe he, uh, he was naive to think that he, you know, uh, that it, maybe, maybe he pulled out too early. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's, that's actually a really cool point because it makes you wonder, you know, what, what was he actually seeing on the day to day Did he realize that this thing is in debt up to its eyeballs and he doesn't want to be attached to any debt um, or did he realize like, Hey, look, this is just not what I want to do, you know, venture, like a, as a venture, uh, position of, you know, but at the same time, you're right. Just finishing the league. What could that have done? Um, just, just to, to finish the season out and at least see, Hey, where are we going at here? Um, but at the same time, it's like, you know, it really makes you wonder. It's like, you know, if you're spending $10 million a week that quick, you know, what are, what, what are you being told and what promises are you being, are, are being made to you that you're realizing, Hey, these, these aren't true, you know, and I'm not going to stick around to see it. Um, and that, that, that was the thing. It was kind of like, you know, it really made you wonder what was actually happening behind, you know, those closed doors. All right. Let me uh, qu- uh, thank, this is great so far. There's a couple, couple more sort of just Absolutely. questions. So sure. tell me uh, on the Orlando front, right? So you're, you're at least closer uh, on the ground level to that part of the story during uh, during all of this, uh, what, what was your sense of uh, how the the local media was responding to the story? I'm, I'm talking really more about the beginnings and the the, uh, uh, the 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 preparation and the beginnings of the league and all that kind of stuff. The fans, um, you know, th- those kinds of things. The buzz in the community uh, before sort of the wheels started to fall off. I mean, I, I remember a game or two on on t- TV watching the bounce house go up. I mean, you know. T- Seemed like there was some pretty. It, it was a pretty real connection, at least in Orlando, certainly in San Antonio, um, and some other places. I, this was not sort of you know completely dead on arrival. No, no, not not by any means um, dead at all. I mean, and and that was the thing is I think it was it was something that was sold to the the local communities that hey we're here you know we we're going to be here for a while we're not going anywhere. This was their big thing was. You know, a lot of things they said in in the press was we are not a one and done league. We are here for the long haul. We want to get involved in the community. And, and, you know, that's what they were told to say, um, you know, on the team level and and whatnot. So that's what everybody wanted to be a part of. Um, And I think that was, you know, really interesting, um, a really interesting approach to really sink their teeth into the community and say, hey, look, we're not this big hot shot league where we want nothing to do with you. Um, we want to support you just as much as you want us to or just as much as we want you to support us. And, um, you know, one of the biggest things that I remember uh, Mike Waddell said uh, in the interview, um, actually, I'm sorry, it might not have been Mike Waddell, but it was someone talking about why were they playing in a, you know, large venue when they easily could have been playing at a smaller division three type school where they're able to completely sell it out and have a fan base actually back the, um, you know, sell the venue out because, you know, essentially you're playing in the, the San Antonio um, uh, dome down there and they, they only had half of the, the stadium open because they knew they couldn't sell uh, seats, but you're, you're talking about paying for that at that point, And you're like, well, how much money are they really spending just to play in that building when they're not, when they're using half of its, uh, its capacity. And same thing with Orlando too. You know, the bounce house, they 
packed in about 30 something thousand seats, but um, to my belief, I want to say they can sell out like 59,000 seats. So again, you're using a small amount of what that place is capable of. And, and it really makes you wonder how much money are they spending just to be there? Um, and that again, kind of goes back to the whole image thing of like, Hey, they want to be a part uh, they want to be a part of the community, but they're also trying to push a big image that they have and they have to maintain that image. So I, I think, you know, hopefully that kind of answers your question. Um, a lot of it was the whole image aspect of it and making sure they were in the good graces of the community media wise to say, Hey, you know, channel such and such in Orlando, come out to the bounce house. It's a reputable place. We're here. We're playing. We got the parking lots filled. Tailgates are going. Come push us on the news. And I think that was a really big thing was um, proving, I guess you could say, that they really do want to be here for the long haul. And, and the merchandise is, is not too expensive <laughs> either, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I guess. Uh, I don't know. Um, but, uh, yeah, no. I mean, the merchandise, like I said, I, I, uh, I've been a diehard Eagles fan for, you know, my whole life. I'm 24 and I've been an Eagles fan uh, from what it looks like picture wise at birth. Uh, basically my dad brought me home in a, an Eagles onesie, um, you know, and he's, his family has had season tickets since the sixties. And I can't even tell you just going to an Eagles game. Some of the Eagles prices uh, for merchandise were actually cheaper than the AF. I mean, for a starter snapback hat, it was about 40 bucks. And those are the forty dollars for a hat. That's MLB new era hat, the fitted hat. Um, that's what that price is, you know, comparable to. And to to come into a a, a city again where people don't even know if you're going to last because it, uh, showing the uh, previous league's history, they don't really last. So why should you invest all this money in the merchandise and whatnot into a league that you don't even know if it's going to be around in five years? And little little did they know they wasn't even going to last a year. Um, one of the gentlemen we interviewed, uh, his name was Zach. He actually was from New Jersey and he ran a internet based AAF fantasy football league. He had like 30 something guys playing in this league. And none of the guys that were in this league were actually in AAF cities. And they were huge fans. Uh, Zach, I believe was the Salt Lake Stallions fan. And, you know, he bought the Jersey and the hat and the, the t-shirts and the orca coolers that they had made and you know all that type of stuff he invested in this franchise that he believed in and they quickly went away and again i mean you're talking investing in nfl level pricing merchandise for a new startup league and and you know it's just it's it's really kind of mind-blowing it's again that's just in my opinion that's a marketing tactic that i don't think really worked too well well all right so we've been kind of harping on the negatives and stuff but what do you think what do you think they got right, at least in concept, ideas, rule changes, you know, approach? Uh, I, you know, I obviously I, I try to be as optimistic as possible about these things and then always look forward to a new league, especially if it's got, you know, good background and good, good suggestions and stuff. And and Lord knows NFL football can can use a few tweaks and, and we, we don't see any sort of stop. Uh, nobody seems to. Uh, be bereft of ideas of how to make uh, the pro game better, whether it's the Spring League or XFL 2.0 or the AAF. It, there seems like it's pretty decent ideas there, both in terms of how to structure contracts and league uh, rules and, 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 and on the field uh, tweaks and stuff. Uh, any things that struck you as, at least at the time, and maybe even since, as weren't bad ideas? Yeah, I mean, I, I personally loved the, the ticket pricing honestly to get communities involved and you know to allow people who don't have super deep pockets to become a season ticket holder and be a part of a league you know i mean i think that's the coolest thing in the world um i wanted to get season tickets you know but like i said i was freshly out of college so that wasn't really feasible um but yeah i mean and i i like the fast gameplay how quick the game happened and i, I like the concept of being able to track these players and, and what they're doing on a game to game basis. I think it's really cool. Um, and, and I just, I don't know. I like, I just like the feel of the AAF. It felt um, almost like I, I, I don't know, for lack of better terms, like family oriented, you know, with the NFL, every team is individually owned um, and they all have different uh, images and, you know, different ways of doing things, I think. And, you know, I, I just think the AAF was really cool. And the way they try to get everybody involved, it, 
in my opinion, just seemed like, you know, hey, we, it, it, I, I bought into that too. The, hey, we are here. We're not going anywhere. Invest in us because we're going to be here for the long haul. Um, and I think that's a really, you know, even though that unfortunately didn't work, I still think that's a really cool way of doing things. Um, getting involved in the community to make it feel, um, you know, hey, you're spending your work dollars to come here and support us. And we want to be supportive of you as well. Um, as a season ticket member, as a fan, as an average game goer, um, where I think the NFL, I don't think really does that, honestly. I mean, you know, like I said, I love my Eagles and, and I love the NFL, but it is just, it is so expensive to go to a game. I mean, you're talking 40 bucks to park and $13 beers and $10 hot dogs. I mean, actually touching on the NFL really quick, I think, you know, Arthur Blank Sports Group, they do it absolutely awesome. Um, you know, affordable pricing for everything throughout the stadium. And the AAF did that with uh, game day uh, concessions and, and parking and stuff like that. Um, I, I just really like how they got the community involved. Um, you know, those are just some of the positives, I think, for sure. Yeah, and, and there were a couple of tweaks to the gameplay and stuff and over, you know, how to handle ties and, and, you know, a little bit of a faster game clock and all that kind of stuff, some safety stuff, uh, no kickoffs. But, uh, you know, I – but but you know I, I think you're also sort of dancing around it too. The NFL doesn't have to do any of these things, right? And right because they know that they're going to have the people that are still going to spend. You know, like I said, my family's been Eagle season ticket holders since the '60s. They know we're not going anywhere, no matter what they do. You know, so it's it's you're right. The NFL does not have to cater to its fans because they're they're here. They're not going anywhere. You know. All right. So as this documentary starts to come out, uh, and then I'll, I'll ask you in a minute, you know, give give us some some you know uh, places of how we find it and what what the the rollout plan is. But but what do you sense is sort of the next chapter in this story? I mean, you in some respects have the luxury of of being able to do this with so much great footage from the inside, so relatively fresh from when the league collapsed. Um, there's clearly going to be more, I think, to this story, especially as some of these principles somehow come out or, or potentially have stories to tell and and other things maybe get revealed and all that kind of stuff. What do you think happens next? And, and do you plan on continuing to follow it, maybe updating and and whatnot? Or do you want to just sort of gauge and maybe what the reception is thus far is so early on in its release? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the reception we've got so far was, you know, messages from people that work for different teams and, and people that were involved, players, and just seeing stuff on Twitter. Um, a lot of people were really... Again, it seemed happy with it. Um, the way it was told, they said it seemed accurate. You know, our goal with making this was not to bash anybody. It was not to tell a false narrative. It was just to really just document what happened from the people we interviewed on the day-to-day -day basis. That was our goal. And if they said nothing but great things about it, then, you know, so be it. And, and that's how we would have edited the film and shot it that way. But, you know, again, it was a lot of, uh, unfortunately, people that their livelihoods were, were damaged through this process. So, I mean, to answer your question, I don't know if I would continue to document it because I almost, I, I almost respect what everybody has said enough to that. This is such a sore subject in their lives. I don't want to keep digging that hole for them and keep having to go through, you know, one comment that I saw on Twitter that really kind of got me was, um, you know, someone said that they're, uh, they don't know if they can even watch this yet because they've had a family member that was uh, financially ruined or I forget to said financially ruined or, or something with their career uh, destroyed by this. And it's like, you know, that's some serious stuff. That is just, that's so much bigger than football. And um, you yeah, know, that is something that I, I definitely want to respect and I don't want to shove it down people's throats too much and, and keep bringing it up to interview subjects. And, you know, I think that's something that sh it should sink in for a lot of people involved that, Hey, this was much bigger than football. And a lot of people, you know, were seriously, I guess you could say ruined by this in the sense. Um, so, I mean that, you know, and, and a tweet like that, when I saw that, I was, I was shocked um, that it's still that fresh for people, you know, almost three years out at this point. Um, you know, and again, a lot of people said, Hey, you know, thanks so much for going down memory lane and, and walking us through what it was like on a day to day, even though I worked, uh, you know, for the team, I don't, I don't really remember it this fresh, but you know, thanks for bringing up these memories. Um, so it, it seems like we've had a lot of, you know, wide range of, of, um, feedback so far, which is really cool. And, you know, and one of the biggest things we wanted to do too was tell, uh, Chris Martin's family story throughout this process, because that guy has absolutely given his entire life to the game of football. And um, this was really his, you know, uh, AAF or the, this was his football redemption story in a sense of, 
what he his life goals were and you know how the AAF was an intricate part of ending his football career um you know so this was kind of his last chance to play the game um so that was a big thing for us too is again to kind of just show that hey this is so much bigger than football and when you you know unfortunately involve so many people around the country you're gonna you know really kind of throw someone's livelihood off and that and that was a big thing for us too like I said we wanted to really let Chris Martin and and share his family story because the guy's the guy's certainly been through a lot all right. Well, let me ask you this one last question, and I'll let you promote. Uh, I, th- th- having been in the midst of putting this together uh, before, during, and after the XFL's second version came and went, uh, and now seeing what the the spring league, at least from a PR perspective, threw out there a couple of months ago, saying we're going to register some of the old USFL team names and try to make it the next generation of the USFL next year, uh, already a shaky enterprise, the spring league by itself. I, so I, I guess my question is, um, what did you think, or what have you thought about both those of those things uh, last year and this year, as well as the, the, maybe the curse of spring football? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is this just sort of a lost cause generally, or Will somebody somehow get it right someday? No, I mean, I, I do think that somebody will get it right. I think it's just going to take the right group of people to get it right. Um, I, I really thought the XFL, honestly, I was kind of getting worried, to be completely honest with you. We were still, you know, I edited the film by myself during COVID in my uh, uh, house, and it was it was just me and, you know, seeing Twitter, how excited people were getting about the XFL. I was really nervous because I thought this film was not going to be even – uh, watchable because everybody was going to be so happy that the XFL is back. There's good spring football and then there's the NFL and it's like, you know, the AAF is, is just a lost cause. Nobody cares anymore. And that was something I was like, you know, I felt like I was on an internal clock race there to, to get this thing done. Um, and, and, you know, I, I really did think the XFL would have worked, but I think, you know, due to COVID, I mean, COVID screwed a lot of things up uh, for sure. Um but I, 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 I do think that spring football can work. And, and um, I'm a big proponent for spring football. I think it's needed, um, especially after spending so much time with these athletes and employees. They, you know, these people truly care about sports and truly care about football. And these guys are willing to give everything they can just to be on a NFL roster. And I think that's really admirable. And I think spring football is needed. And even if they, these guys never get to that NFL roster – I think that, um, you know, having a spring league is, is important because it is good football. And, uh, you know, I, I think that the talks with the – I haven't really followed the spring league too much, but the talks with the Freedom Football League, like we interviewed Bob Vanek, um, and, you know, he has – with his, re, you know, launch of the Freedom Football League, it seems like he has super great intentions just to, to really make sure it works and to get this thing off the ground and treat these players right. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, and I really hope something like that does work out. Um, so I'll be rooting for the Freedom Football League for sure um, when they launch. But, you know, I, I do think spring football can work. I just I do think it needs the right group of people behind it to make sure um, this doesn't happen again. Yeah, it's interesting, too, that you had this sort of curiosity uh, that's still around called the Fan Control Football League uh, this year, which was essentially, I guess, uh, doubling down on whatever this app idea that Epersol and, and his investors thought. And MGM thought that they were able to do it. Hokey, yeah, I mean, you know, you know, it was. Uh, I saw some of the, the games were on Twitch and stuff, and um, you know, I, it's certainly by no means close to being perfected. But uh, you can see that people are going to continue to 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 tamp down on that or build up on that idea of, hey, can I be, you know, can I make the make the calls or be part of the mix or can I be part of the ownership and that kind of stuff? These are all ideas, frankly, that that I think Ebersol was sort of, you know. To grandios with grandiosity, kind of try to bring it to too much too quickly, though, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, something like that where fans have owned a portion of the team or been involved in play calling or uh, you know that type of stuff that has never been done, and for it to just be you know launched untested, uh, essentially uncontrolled, just to be like, hey, we're here, you can be a part of our league and get ownership and buy season tickets and 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 get a percentage and and you know call the plays and bet on these players individual stats like that is stuff that is so complex and it really makes you wonder if it was perfected though why because the nfl loves making money right 
So if that's something that is actually perfected, then why hasn't the NFL done it yet? Um, which makes you really believe that it's just, it's not, I don't know if we're ready for that yet, or I don't know if it's possible to do that yet efficiently um, on, on a game to game basis. I mean, that takes a, a large amount of technology to do something like that. Yeah. You're also though speaking on, on two sort of very important points though, right? Number one, the cost of the NFL, right, is out of the reach to the average fan. So there's an opportunity in a market there for quality, quality pro football for sure. As that gap continues to grow and probably get out of uh, obscenely out of out of out of control. And number two, you hinted at it too. There never seems to be, and I see we've seen this with all of our conversation with all kinds of challenger leagues in different sports, right? But football prime among them is there's a talent pool, right? And giving people a legitimate or perceived legitimate chance to continue play to one more time, just, just give it a last shot and see if their dream can be fulfilled in some way, shape or form and make a living at it. Um, there's a hefty amount of athletes coming out of college and or alternatives to college that would, that absolutely will suspend disbelief to give it a shot one more time. Right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, you know, I was talking to Chris Martin the other day and, you know, he just had another back surgery and he literally, I was talking to him and, you know, we were kind of just, you know, kicking ideas around. And I was like, yeah, would you actually ever play ball again? And he was like in a heartbeat. I'm in the best shape of my life. I would love to give it one more chance. And it, it really just makes you wonder, like, you know, the, the passion behind these guys that they want to just play one more game. Um, I, I think it's, again, really admirable. And I think it's super cool that they can do something like that um, and are willing to do something like that. Um, and again, it just shows you, the amount of people that are out there that really want to play football, you know, again, in hockey and, and basketball and stuff, you're looking at so many leagues that these guys have, uh, these guys have uh, available to them to play uh, on a consistent basis. And, you know, football just doesn't have that. It's, it's either college or pros or you're done, you know, and, and that's kind of unfortunately where we're still at now after all these leagues have tried to go, um, you know, over time. All right, time to promote. Tell us uh, where it's available now, how people can get it, what your plans are for expanding it. I watched it uh, via Amazon Prime. I rented it for 30 days. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, I suspect that you want to broaden its um, uh, its uh, availability as well. So what's the now and what's the future of distribution of this film? Yeah, that's the goal for sure, to get it uh, readily available to everybody. So, um, you know... Amazon Prime, Apple TV, uh, to, you know, and, and our request for everybody watching is to please go ahead and leave it a review because that helps put our, uh, you know, algorithm to the top and, and um, you know, get this film seen by everybody. So everybody who knows nothing, you know, one of the coolest reviews we had was, you know, I know nothing about football. I watched this with my husband and it is just the coolest thing in the world. It's not about football and that's, that's our goal is to, to show people that this, you know, really has nothing to do with football. It's just, it's about uh, a story of people and, you know, humanity, I guess you could say that, that I think was, I think was really cool to be a part of. So I hope, you know, everybody gets a chance to watch it and, and hopefully get it seen by more people. The Alliance of American Football continues to fascinate, and uh, I highly encourage you all to get out there and download this amazingly interesting documentary, uh, some great personal stories, some very raw ones, as a matter of fact, uh, amazing inside footage, uh, and um, I, I would argue the first comprehensive and relatively uh, immediate take on just what the hell happened with this league. Uh, again, it is called Alliance is Broken, uh, and it is available for download right now on places like Prime Video, uh, Apple TV, uh, on iTunes, Vimeo. Uh, you can download it and watch it from Google Play or from, from YouTube and a bunch of other places where good uh, downloads of video are found. And, and there will be more places, as, uh, uh, as we've talked about with Steve, the, for it to be found over time. Uh, but it won't cost you but a couple of bucks uh, to download and enjoy, either rent it or own it. Uh, I'm sure it will come to a Pure Play streamer at some point uh, in the future. But um, I wouldn't wait that long because it's too damn good to miss. 
Uh, and uh, if you're a football fan, if you remember the AAF from just Nary two and a half years ago, uh, or just intrigued by it, uh, or maybe you're, uh, you know, you're a huge uh, Orlando Apollos fan or, uh, <laughs> or, or a San Diego Fleet uh, fanatic, uh, you name it, uh, it, it's worthwhile and you're going to love it. It's uh, really well done. Uh, and again, again, it's called Alliances Broken and uh, run, don't walk uh, to download it and watch it. And um, you will proverbially and literally be glad you did. Um, let's see. You can also uh, follow uh, Steve uh, on his uh, Twitter feed at S Potter underscore visuals. S Potter underscore visuals. Um, and uh, you'll find uh, links to um, uh, his film production company uh, and all that kind of good stuff. And look, you can just go online and, and find there are a number of different uh, articles out there. He's doing a lot of interviews. Uh, and uh, it, you're going to hear more and more about this great documentary. Uh, and hopefully uh, you'll uh, you'll enjoy it as much as I did. Uh, let's see. While you're on the uh, on the interwebs, why don't you uh, bookmark our website if you haven't done that already, for goodness sake. Uh, and that's GoodSeatsStillAvailable.com. Yeah, that's where we post all of our episodes, both uh, past, present, this week's episode number 227, of course, and future. Uh, but of course, the best way, frankly, to keep up with uh, all the latest uh, episodes is to subscribe or follow however, whatever you do uh, with your favorite podcast catcher or streamer uh, and uh, and tell your friends about it, too, for God's sakes, please. Um, we uh, just love when uh, we get new listeners and um, subscribers and all that kind of good stuff. And of course, please rate and review where you can. That helps the old algorithm kind of find us and put us on the top of uh, people's lists for consideration and such. Um, on our website at GoodSeatStillAvailable.com, you will find a convenient link to our weekly email newsletter, which gives you a little tip off of what we're going to be talking about the, that uh, coming week. Uh, that's also the place you can find our, all of our various social media feeds. In particular, on Facebook, you'll find us at Good Seats Still Available. On Instagram, you'll find us at Good Seats Still Available. And on Twitter, you'll find us at Good Seats Still. See what I did there? Um, so follow us early and often there. Fun stuff to be had uh, in those places. What else? How about uh, email? You want to send us some? By all means. We're at hello at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Um, and I think that's kind of it for promoting ourselves. Uh, let's promote the uh, good uh, graces and uh, talents uh, of one Jerry Payne. Jerry Payne Audio Excellence. Thank you, kind sir, once again for our 227th uh, opportunity to work together. Thank you very much for putting all of our editorial and uh, production pieces together, uh, making uh, sense of this hash that we sent you this week into something comprehensible. We appreciate that. And uh, thank you, of course, good friends, for listening. Lots of great stuff and topics to come. Boy, oh boy, you have no idea what's coming your way soon. Uh, so stay tuned. Don't, uh, don't uh, go away from that feed too much longer. Because uh, there's likely to be a story or a, a topic that uh, we're going to be uh, diving into that you're going to be uh, wanting to listen to and enjoy. Uh, so until then, thanks so much for listening this week. And uh, God willing, we'll uh, talk to you next week. Thanks very much. Until then, take care. Bye. Bye.